I think, okay, um, good evening. I think we're ready to uh, start. So dear colleagues, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the closing lecture in translation and interpreting by Professor Hamouda Salhi. This event is part of the master's program in translation and interpreting at the University of Tunis, El Manar, and the Turguman project and very important events. Um, my name is Simon Zupan. I'm Professor of Translation Studies at the University of Maribor in Slovenia, where I'm um, also locate, located right now. And I will be co-chairing this event. And the other co-chair uh, is uh, my colleague, Sami Boyad, who is a uh, full-time conference interpreter, member of AIC, and accredited member of Interpretation Service of uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, NATO, and the UN with, at, in Geneva. And he's joining us from uh, Brussels, where he's also based. So good evening, Sami. Good evening, Simon. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. So just before I, uh, or just before we introduce the speaker and give him the floor, uh, please allow me to do some uh, housekeeping and explain how this uh, evening will actually run. So um, the official, uh, so we have been allocated um, an hour and a half or around 90 minutes for this uh, lecture. And the lecture will roughly have or fall into two parts. So the first uh, will comprise a lecture by Professor Salhi, um, which will take about 50 minutes. And then the lecture will be followed by a discussion and the Q&A, for which we will have another uh, 40 or so minutes, so that the official part of the event will close somewhere around um, 8.30 Tunis time. Now, um, I should also mention uh, that the conference is being uh, recorded and that the recording of this event will then later be available on YouTube. And uh, we would, uh, of course, also like to point out that um, given that this place, given that this talk is taking place uh, online, that we want to make it as interactive as possible. So um, if you have any questions or comments um, during the, um, the lecture, you are most welcome to post those in the Zoom chat. And alternatively, of course, you can save them later for the discussion. And I know that some of you are also um, uh, watching us uh, on Facebook. And of course, uh, you two are, of course, welcome to um, post questions and comments in the comment section on Facebook. And um, he, um, Hamuda has also asked me to actually ask you one thing in advance, and namely, his, uh, he wanted to know, or he would like to know as to who the participants uh, are. So you are all welcome to post in the chat, uh, maybe you should mention your, uh, your language and the country you come from. So uh, please feel free to, to post um, those pieces of information in the chat. And uh, maybe just one final request. Um, um, we would like to ask everyone to keep uh, their microphones muted during the, during the lecture so as, to not, uh, so as not to disturb the speaker. And I think uh, that more or less makes it as far as the um, more or less technical announcements go. And uh, uh, I now actually have the pleasure and honor to introduce the speaker. Uh, so Professor Hamuda Sarhi, I'm sure that uh, many of you know him already, but if not, um, please allow me to introduce him briefly in a couple of sentences. So Dr. Sarhi is the director of Masters of the Masters Program in Translation and Interpreting at the University of Tunis, El Manar. He is founder and organizer of the International Tinvom Conference, the first conference on translation and interpreting, new voices on the marketplace. And he has published extensively in the field of translation and cross-cultural communication. And he has also taken part in um, a number of international conferences. He also has extensive professional experience as a senior conference interpreter, translator, as well as language consultant in, again, in various areas such as law, business, security, documentary, diplomacy, administration, cross-cultural matters, and communication. 
uh, Dr. Sahi has also successfully surfed, uh, serviced thousands of meetings, workshop, workshops, and conferences as an uh, international interpreter. He interprets around, around 220 days per year on average. And he also acted has acted as interpreting consultant, interpreting team leader, and chief interpreter, coordinating and chairing large teams of interpreters for a number of organizations and clients. He, <laughs> among, among others, has interpreted for uh, high-profile world <laughs> leaders, such as former and current UN Secretaries General Ban Ki-moon or Antonio Guterres, or the current Russian President Vladimir put in to, but to mention, but a few. Dr. Sahi is also um, accredited to several international institutions, such as the United Nations, World Bank, and many international NGOs, as well as uh, uh, several governments. He's also a uh, prolific um, author and researcher, and his research interests are, lie at the intersection between interpreting studies, lexical and communication studies, translation pedagogy and the and professional aspects of interpreting. He's also a member of the editorial board of translation and translanguaging in multilingual contexts, um, a journal published by John Benjamins. He's also founder, founder of the uh, Turguman project for translation practice training and research. I should also mention that Dr. Sahi holds a BA in, BA in translation, an MA in linguistics, and a PhD in translation studies. And he also received specialized training in cultural translation and corpus processing. Now, I believe that all of the above uh, certainly qualifies him to talk with some competence um, about the subject of uh, this lecture. Uh, which is the which is judicial cooperation between interpreters and judges, and as you can see, his um, talk is also entitled as the search for common ground, interpreters and judges in judicial cooperation. And with this, uh, uh, Hamuda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, thank you uh, all for coming. Good evening, dear friends, colleagues, and, and students, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us in this uh, lecture, this closing lecture today, this evening. So, so it is a, a Friday evening for some. So uh, I'm really very sorry to keep you home uh, and perhaps uh, deny you the pleasure of uh, in, at least in some countries, going out and enjoying the evening. So uh, I also would like to thank the uh, co-chairs uh, of the session, Simon and Sami, who are very close friend, uh, friends of mine. Thank you for offering to introduce uh, this lecture, to facilitate the discussion and also to contribute to what uh, I might say in, in, in the matter, in the, in the subject. Uh, I would like to welcome you all to this lecture, uh, namely Professor Jeber. So thank you, you uh, honored us in this uh, in this uh, evening. As you can read, I've called my presentation "The Search for Common Ground: Interpreters and Judges in Judicial Cooperation." And here I'm going to take the context of international judicial cooperation. Uh, basically in criminal matters and more particularly in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, space as a case study, despite the fact that I, uh, uh, I, uh, I can't pledge that I'm going to uh, present the um, uh, results of the study I'm conducting. But before I start the uh, talk, I would like to ask you some questions in the uh, poll. So I would like to request uh, my colleague Safa to um, make the questions visible. Uh, these are, I think, four or five questions. So they are yes or no questions. And I would like to invite you to answer those questions. The first question is, is legal language context dependent? Yes or no? So the second question, 
is intention based translation always faithful and ethical to some extent and try please to link all of these or uh, questions to the uh, legal context and more particularly the judicial cooperation and uh, the work for judges uh, the third question can legal drafting be idiosyncratic are there idiosyncrasies when drafting a law or a provision or a rule and the fourth question, do you uh, want your translation to stand as a parallel text? Uh, parallel in the sense that it is independent, but it is having the same status as the original uh, text or the original provision when you are translating. So uh, I invite you to answer these questions and I will give you 30 seconds or a little bit more to submit your uh, responses. Thank you. Thank you. I think you all answered the uh, questions. So here are the results of the questions. So is legal language context dependent? 83% responded yes. Is intention-based translation always faithful and ethical? No, up to 92%. Uh, Can legal drafting be idiosyncratic? Yes. 67 percent and the last question do you want or oh, before lot sorry there are other questions uh, do you want your translation to stand as a parallel text 92 percent yes do you intervene sorry i, I missed uh, the other questions do you intervene in your translation or interpreting 67 percent answered yes and are there constraints on a judge's ability to make discretions, to use here discretionary power? 90% uh, answered yes, and 8% no. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for answering these questions. At the outset, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that in this talk, I'm not going to present the uh, final results of the study I'm conducting in which I have conducted interviews and uh, taken uh, field notes from the uh, conferences that I have served as, uh, served as, as interpreter and the documents that I have uh, reviewed as a reviewer and reviser uh, to uh, some extent, but rather I'm going to throw some thoughts, some uh, arguments about the, the Mediation Act, the Mediation Act in translation and interpreting both. So I don't claim to offer a fully-fledged approach or theory or a model to follow. But rather, I would like to invite you to take part in the discussion later on and or now, as Simon has mentioned it in the in the chat, uh, to take part in this discussion actively and report about your own experiences uh, with regard to the arguments that I'm going to lay down uh, uh, in the course of the lecture uh, and, and, and the issues I'm going to, to discuss. So I would love to learn also from your diverse uh, backgrounds, diverse uh, languages, diverse uh, experiences. If you are expecting me to talk uh, about translation, uh, translation equivalence, and glorify the value of uh, faithfulness as taught, uh, in translation classrooms and uh, as stipulated in codes of ethics, then I'm sorry uh, to disappoint you here. Uh, this is the first apology I'm sending out to you. Because I'm going to tell you a story uh, of the values of um, equality, of difference, of independence. 
of parallelism in a way of a parallel thing that is being produced uh, with the very first thing whether it is a discourse interpreted discourse or a uh, a a, uh, a target language text so because i'm going to tell you uh, this story uh, i would like first to investigate how these uh, three uh, values are closely related to each other how, how are they related to the concepts uh, to other concepts and, and and how they are applicable also in daily life uh, applicable to gender women men in the daily conversation uh, if we go home or go to the this context uh, then we can uh, easily understand this multilateral relationship between translation, uh, women, men, equality, difference, independence, uh, uh, and so on. So I'm going to tell you um, a joke now. Um, so thank you for uh, going to the other slide. Uh, there is an old joke that he keeps on circulating on the internet uh, that can explain that relationship. Uh, how should women, women's language, be interpreted by faithfully by men, and how uh, men's language uh, uh, be translated faithfully by uh, by women? Uh, my profound apologies uh, in advance to all women. So no offense. Yes, most of the time means no. No, most of the time means yes. Maybe means no. I'm sorry, you have to interpret it as a man. You will be sorry. You need, I want. Am I fat? Tell me I'm beautiful. You have to learn to communicate. Jack means just agree with me. Now, how should men's language be interpreted faithfully by women? So these translations of our women are out there. So these are some of the secrets about men. When a man says, can I help you with dinner? should be translated by um, an intelligent woman, why isn't it already on the table? Take a break, honey. You are working too hard. Translated, I can't hear the game over the vacuum cleaner. That's interesting, dear. Translated, are you still talking? Then, what did you do? What did, what did, what did I do this time? means, what did you catch me at? We share the housework, and so on and so forth. So, this is a gender truth revealed through translation proof. So, translation uh, makes the hidden meaning, the implied meaning, very visible. And this is, by the way, for translation researchers, this is called explicitation to make something that is implicit, uh, more explicit in the target language. So how to explain now that yes means no in this context? Or this summer, this summer uh, means spring in, for example, the sonnet of Shakespeare, shall I compare thee to a summer's day if it is translated by a poet from a country uh, where weather is warm, like in a Saudi poet, for example. So I think he needs to convert uh, summer to, uh, to spring. Multilingualism. There is a biblical allegory about the Tower of Babel or the Tower of Babel, which can teach us that multilingualism is a punishment from God that the language barrier has been 
known since the time of, of, of the Tawa, uh, Babel, when people were punished by the loss of the possibility to communicate, speaking different languages. It is quite evident that social groups uh, are separated by their languages, by their cultures, by their legal systems. Every language protects its own group, its own identity, its own system, its own establishment, like a three-headed dragon in a uh, fairy tale. Millions of people try to destroy that barrier by learning that foreign language, accessing the, the foreign language, the, the identity. However, learning a language does not necessarily lead to an effective communication. And you know this quite well. That's why uh, clients and organizers have uh, recourse always, almost always, to professional interpreters or professional uh, translators. So uh, because the cultural fans looming large behind the linguistic wall, thus social groups are separated by two strong barriers, the walls and the fences which are interfering with their communication. These walls and fences defend the social groups from numerous intruders, trying to penetrate into the group's domain, trying to penetrate, in this case, in this context, into the legal systems, which are very different. Now, People and states and agents or entities who wish to cooperate and try to overturn or overcome those uh, fences and walls are certainly baffled by the intricacies of foreign cultures and the different systems and laws. Now, communication, translation, idiosyncrasy, and anxiety. The new age of sophisticated communication and cutting edge subjects and cross border cooperation, especially cross border co uh, cooperation in judicial, uh, in judicial uh, affairs, in criminal matters that are dictated by the development and advancement of the tools used. To perpetrate crimes uh, because you, you, you will see that uh, now that the crimes are more and more cross-border. You will be having a perpetrator located in one context and the particular jurisdiction. Uh, uh, the victim is another in another country using another language and uh, under uh, a second ju jurisdiction, and the evidence, more uh, particularly e-evidence, is located somewhere else, and it has to be obtained uh, from a third country. This requires uh, to uh, prosecute that crime, requires a uh, high level of cooperation. High level of cooperation requires uh, some translation, some interpreting, because the three jurisdictions, they speak different languages, and even the judges or the agents uh, and the contact per points or persons, they speak different languages. So they need to cooperate, and they need to have some common ground for such cooperation. One of the main common grounds, I'm going to speak about that in a moment, is language. So so uh, you see that we can no longer deal with that cooperation in this uh, new age with the naive and, dare say, stupid equivalence, the uh, very straightforward equivalence. Because when we establish the equivalence between terms, for example, there is always something that is lost. There is always something that is... Uh, distorted, and there is something that is missing, and I'm going to give you some examples uh, uh, later on. Uh, 
So one translator has expressed this idea more clearly uh, when he said, I am not looking for equivalent text. I'm looking for an analogy. And in this talk, I'm going to replace the, the word analogy by parallelism. So means to establish a second text that is parallel to the first text. So I'm going to give some assumptions now. And these are assumptions, especially for junior translators and interpreters to consider. Assumption number one. Uh, any piece of writing or any text that is drafted and hence any reading or interpretation is idiosyncratic to a very good extent. So this is the very first assumption. Here I mean particularly the special and novel usages of lexical items and concepts and uh, technical uh, terms. Uh, there are in each text, in each uh, drafted piece, they are used to express messages that are novel. All authors and drafters have their own idiosyncrasies. That's why this requires a work of interpretation. And most of the interpretation work is carried out by judges themselves when they are prosecuting a case. So they... Uh, they, they, they need to interpret the case. Uh, one author expressed this idea more clearly, and this applies also to the legal uh, context, when she said, quote, as a writer, I am a very private person. As soon as a book is out there, the book, she said, not my book, she does not claim ownership over the ideas contained in the book, uh, out there for the reader, then uh, out, out there the, for the translator, he is going to open very different worlds, very different worlds for me, and I am very open to that. She adds another confession when she said, I don't even know what exactly I have written. So, I can't tell how this is exactly or should be translated. So you see that this, this statement confirms the, the, the second assumption that uh, all authors and drafters are betrayed by, by the language and they have high level of anxiety, anxiety associated with, with writing in general, the, 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 the writing process. Is this what I meant? Is this the idea? But sometimes something is always distorted. And, you know, in philosophy, uh, this has been debated, debated sorry, extensively. So the question here that you have answered is intention-based translation, always faithful and ethical? Not always. To... Uh, my understanding. So there are two conclusions out of this assumption. The conclusion number one is that communication is in part, or perhaps uh, a major part, is about miscommunication. And translation, in turn, is in part, perhaps a major part, is about mistranslation and, uh, and untranslatability more particularly. Conclusion number two, ownership of the thing and the distance to distance yourself from your text are two sides of the same coin. This applies to both translation of creative texts and translation of legal texts. Source language authors and drafters are also excited to see what kind of resonance, what kind of echo, what kind of world trans created, transplanted in the other language, in the other context, in the other jurisdiction, because it is, there is a work of adaptation here carried out by the translator or the interpreter in this case. Assumption number three, interpreters and interpretation. An interpreting act is 
not exclusively the work of professional interpreters. Most of the interpreting stuff is being carried out by non-professional interpreters, by judges themselves. When they are sending, for example, an MLA, Mutual Legal Assistance, request, they draft it in the other language. So they translate, or they hand this task over to a colleague of, of theirs to translate it for them into the other language, the language of the requested country, request, requested state. And this is by obligation, by law, you have to translate it as a requesting state or requesting authority. So the other issue is here uh, is that interpreters, translators, judges, and other agents, they all perform the act of interpretation and interpreting both. And you know the difference between interpretation, which is a ta'wil uh, in Arabic, and interpreting, which is the act of a professional activity or exercise. Now, interpretation is exercised by a judge within the discretionary space, discretionary power he is endowed with, and the discretionary space he, is, he has in interpreting and applying uh, the law and, and the way in which he must account for the decisions taken in the decision process by means of argumentation. The college. That's why uh, in, in, in any verdict or judgment, there is always the justification. And justification is a space for the judge, especially the ruling judge, the sitting judge, to justify uh, the reasons uh, behind uh, the, 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 the ruling. Now, should we trust authors? Um, another question that uh, a novice interpreter and translator should ask uh, the question of why uh, the uh, or how, more particularly, the translated text or the discourse describes and hence influences the, the, the world and the existing systems. So any translation has an impact over the context. Uh, or the judicial uh, system uh, in place. So, uh, and this is a question that has been studied extensively by translation scholars and linguists uh, for a, a very long uh, time. Uh, is a translator or interpreter merely a parrot mimicking the source language author or speaker, or does translation products and interpreting outputs actually describe the way those mediators translators and interpreters, mediators, understand the system and are the spin from what they know uh, and, and they describe or reflect their vision to the world as mediators, of course, because the position of being a mediator is different from being in one of the two extremes. This is a subject that only recently translation researchers uh, and psychologists have begun to be able to study empirically, especially in interpreting studies. They can ask questions like, does it matter that the moon, la lune, in Arabic is he, al-qamaru, and in French it is she, la lune, and in English it is it. Does it matter that uh, one language has one word for blue, green, and others have different words for blue, blue, and green? Back to practice, translating and interpreting in a particular context. So what I have spoken about now was um, were arguments in broader terms. So let's try now to narrow them down and speak within a particular context. The context of uh, translating and interpreting in, uh, in the framework of cooperation, judicial cooperation in uh, uh, judicial cooperation in uh, international judicial cooperation in criminal matters and more particularly as part of a project or program called the Euromed Justice and the Euromed Justice program uh, attempts to further develop the concept of sustainable cooperation uh, mechanism for cross-border uh, judicial cooperation in criminal matters in between the 27 EU uh, states 
and nine South partner uh, states, namely Algeria, uh, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Libya, Morocco, Palestine, and Tunisia. So uh, my role as interpreter and reviewer, as I said earlier, has enabled me to discuss judicial cooperation uh, and the related terms and, and, and jargon and, and challenges in such cooperation with judges from these uh, countries, 28 uh, EU states using different languages and they have different jurisdictions, despite that they have a sort of one unified jurisdiction at some, at some level. Uh, and the uh, Middle Eastern st uh, states, who, uh, which are having also uh, very different uh, judicial systems, despite the fact that most of them, except for Israel, they are uh, using uh, the same official language. So the official language of that jurisdiction is Arabic. Uh, so the question, do you want your translation to speak about the world, to stand as a parallel text? I would say yes, because I am a mediator and I can learn from comparative, uh, comparative law. Uh, do you intervene in translation or interpreting? The answer, one of the answers uh, is, or the answer to this question is extensively debated in Mona Baker and Anthony Pym. 2008, uh, so they noted that that intervention is inherent in the act of translation and interpreting. Let me give you one example now from the legal context, soft. Soft is a, uh, an adjective uh, for, uh, as presented most of the time as a general vocabulary word, but it can be a legal term. So, uh, as you can see here, soft is translated into layina, layin, marin, sa'il, ghair muhassan, ghair mubashir, soft skills, maharat shakhsiya aw aam, despite the fact that I am not uh, quite convinced with this translation. Uh, soft skinned vehicle, markaba ghair musaffaha, you see ghair musaffaha for soft. Uh, uh, or musaffaha, uh, uh, soft, rahu, uh, bi, and so on and so forth. So you see here, uh, there is always something lost from soft when you render it into Arabic. And uh, this is the um, idea of anxiety that I have, uh, that I have um, uh, highlighted early on. So judges among themselves and judges and translators, they are all looking for uh, some common ground for such cooperation, uh, for the use of language, uh, use of discourse, jargon, to um, bypass those um, walls and fences. Comparative law, the first common ground is comparative law and interpreting. Comparative law offers a suitable and solid ground for interpreting, interpreting legal and judicial discourse. This is especially, or this especially holds true for interpreting cross-border cases. Common ground to bilateral and multilateral instruments like United Nations conventions, counter-terrorism, for example, convention, uh, and because the drafters of the, those conventions and instruments, they could take into account the various usages of uh, terms and accommodate the differences in one setting, in one instrument. So only rarely in the context of multilingual organizations and legal systems with one legal order, like in Spain, for example, Catalan and, uh, and Spanish, or Canada, French and English, uh, Flemish uh, and uh, French in, in Belgium, uh, and Switzerland is another case also, uh, co-drafted multilingual uh, instruments. So uh, you will be having uh, very um, uh, uh, terms 
that are parallel to each other, texts that are parallel to each other, provisions that are parallel to each other, and they have the same power. They have the same power, despite the fact that the 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 languages they have. I can use the term side effects when you read the instruction in English. Uh, for ex for example, uh, you will understand something a little bit more or less than when you read it in French. Uh, and and uh, languages they cannot disassociate themselves from the legacy, the culture, and so on. So at the same time, legal terms created in a context of multilingual international uh, organizations, uh, they can be they can offer a, a good uh, ground, as I said. Uh, and they are available on the internet. This is the very good thing, especially uh, for Arabic. Uh, the United uh, Arabic is one of the six official languages of the United Nations. So we can, when we interpret uh, uh, in a conference, for example, uh, that uh, and, and the participants come from the different um, different Ar Ar Arab countries, then we have recourse to the. Uh, uh, we have recourse to the to the to the uh, uh, to to the terms unified terms, and we feel safe, more safe uh, in a way. So uh, globalization adds a more dimension to comparative analysis with the availability of corpora and so on. So there is possibility uh, to use uh, corpora as minds to search for. Uh, parallel corpora in, in particular. So I'm not going to go into details of comparable corpora and parallel corpora and so on. So the translator and terminologist in particular uh, have to consider these uh, international legal frameworks, which offer um, extensive and unified definitions. Uh, and the United Conventions offering unified language with English being almost always the lingua franca, the uh, language that is used to draft, to have the first drafts, and then uh, the uh, other languages, they are only versions of uh, the original English. Uh, uh, so it is reflecting uh, the, the definitions, more, more or less they reflect the uh, Anglo-Saxon culture. Despite the fact that there are differences, by the way, and uh, this has been discussed also by um, uh, legal practitioners and, and, and uh, scholars, uh, that the English of British laws, for example, and when UK was a member of the EU, uh, are different from, uh, or the, the English I mean here, is different from the English used by uh, by. Uh, the EU practitioners or the English used in EU laws. Uh, uh, so, despite the, this is a translation within the same language, um, there are obstacles to cooperation. Obstacle number one, the problem of legal... Uh, the, the laws are not very well determined. Uh, uh, and this means that there is always a determinacy challenge in the law, and that the, the, the rules uh, determine the outcomes in every case. This view of law can be called legal formalism, and laws are much more dynamic, so they are not binary in a way in their interpretation, and the, the, the explanation and the interpretation is not very straightforward. So... Um, the roots of the problem of legal indeterminacy uh, can be traced back to the, a distinction that can be found uh, in uh, the literature. Uh, so legal texts are not determinate and they leave some room uh, for vagueness, ambiguity, uh, and lack of precision. Here, in addition to that, there is another problem that is related to whether the law is wholly indeterminate and whether there are constraints to uh, a judge's a ability to make discretions. There are uh, constraints, certainly, 
but uh, the space of discretion and the discretionary power is really high, is at least higher than I initially uh, thought when I discussed this with, with, with the judges. So uh, the other problem is, um, or has to do with traveling terms. Uh, some terms, they really travel across languages, uh, like the term uh, kafala. And here I have, uh, I would like to take, uh, to investigate this term uh, more extensively uh, in a moment. And there is another problem related, an obstacle uh, related to interpretation and argumentation, because law is subject to interpretation. You cannot understand the law without interpretation, without argumentation. Uh, and, and the argumentation and interpretation as acts are carried out by judges themselves, let alone a, a, an interpreter or a translator. Argumentation is always determined by a set of variables, namely topic-related, contextual constraints, and cultural conventions, uh, and idiosyncratic preferences, uh, as Fairclough has put it. So translation always falls short of its goal, uh, means it does not convey the real meaning or concepts or style or jargon. Uh, and because the word, the meanings of words are never fixed and they are dynamic, they are jelly and malleable by authors and, dra uh, and drafters. Uh, so it is very interesting to investigate that in the context of law and the, um, the, the issue of interpretation. The idea of law uh, as carved in stone is only an illusion. Uh, so now uh, let's move on to the idea of, uh, of interpretation uh, with the discretionary power of, 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 of the judge. I'll give you an example. The judge in any jurisdiction has the power to draw the line between sometimes two uh, conflicting, two conflicting concepts and terms. I'll give you an example in, in, in this context of uh, cross-border judicial cooperation. The burden of proof versus the presumption of innocence. So two, con two seemingly conflicting concepts. Second, banking secrecy and how to preserve it, whether to preserve it or not, and the spontaneous exchange or transfer of data. Too conflicting, it is up to, to the judge to decide about whether that act falls within that concept, to call it something, or that concept. So there is difference here. For the same act, the other... Uh, dichotomy, I would say, is about the so-called joint investigation techniques like joint uh, investigation teams, when exactly like uh, I pointed out earlier, there is a cross-border crime with instruments and victims and uh, perpetrators and evidence located in different uh, countries. Some of uh, the techniques of cooperation is to uh, to set up joint investigation teams versus state sovereignty. Some of the states and some of the judges, they say, we cannot have a judge or a, a prosecutor acting uh, in our soil to arrest, to do some uh, acts like search, arrest, and so on. Now, the other obstacle has to do with sociocultural differences. There are sociocultural implications uh, derived from cultural contexts, identity, and perceptions, mm -hmm. uh, and beliefs relating to the crime itself, and, and, and the public perception of, of, of the crime and its seriousness. And a very popular uh, example is cattle stealing. Cattle stealing, by the way, which was a crime punished by death under Roman law. Now, allow me to investigate two terms, and I will finish with that. The first term is the term of and concept of extradition. Uh, 
And the other one is adoption. So extradition and adoption in translation. Extradition is the removal of a, a person from, or a suspect, or a, um, a sentenced person from a requested state to a requesting state for criminal prosecution or punishment. Put differently, to extradite is to surrender or obtain surrender of a fugitive from one jurisdiction to another means to move this case from one jurisdiction to another. But extradition is normally enabled, as I understood it from the uh, documents that have been produced uh, within this uh, project. There were five uh, instruments, international judicial cooperation and uh, uh, the gaps analysis and so on. So extradition is normally enabled by a bilateral and multilateral treaty. Uh, and in rare cases, some states extradite without a treaty, but this is very rare. Uh, by enacting a law or concluding a treaty, a state sets the conditions for extradition. Common bars uh, to uh, extradition include uh, conditions such as dual dual criminality means that the act is uh, is um, the act that perpetrated by 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 the person uh, in question is uh, also um, uh, incriminated by both jurisdictions it means the jurisdictions of the requesting and the requested states uh, the nature of the alleged crime. Most states refuse the extradition of persons uh, suspected with political crimes. So this is an exception. Uh, forms of punishment. Uh, many states refuse extradition to, uh, to uh, countries uh, where the persons or the convicted persons may face capital punishment or face torture. Uh, so here there are different differences in their jurisdictions, and uh, this might be in conflict with the uh, principle of reciprocity, to treat me the way I treat you. On the other hand, many countries did not include uh, any bilateral agreements, uh, and uh, so uh, mo some countries uh, refused to grant extradition uh, this includes Tunisia, Russia, Ukraine, Libya, and Algeria. Uh, so here, extradition is a case that needs interpretation and needs knowledge about different jurisdictions. And the interpreter and the translator needs to have access to that, to that knowledge. The other example is the example of uh, adoption. Adoption is translated into Arabic as at tabanni It's the process by which an adult becomes the official guardian to a child. Uh, but this is not allowed under Sharia law. Okay. Uh, now, I'm not going to discuss this because I have somebody uh, who has discussed this for me. Uh, the president of the uh, Court of Justice of the European Union. I have conducted a uh, interview with him and he included in the interview a case uh, of uh, kafala and how to translate kafala into a European, uh, to translate it into a European uh, friendly in a way uh, term. So, uh, can you, yes, I would like to uh, display this uh, interview. And this very simply, that we cannot accept that our case law would not protect human rights at least as well as the Strasbourg court protects it. Because they are saying 
the minimum standard law, that is they are interpreting the minimum standard common to 47 states, the 28 of which for the European Union are part of it, so we must at the very least comply with that standard. But very often we go way beyond it in terms of protection because we are a much smaller and more homogeneous group of states. We quote the case law of Strasbourg all the time. And in crucial cases, very important cases, for instance, just I cannot yet say the, the, the solution, but we had last Friday in our deliberation of the Grand Chamber, 15 judges, a request for a preliminary ruling, you now know what it is, brought to us by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. And the judgment will be delivered on the 26th of March, so three days before the foreseen Brexit day, on the express request of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom that the judgment be in any event delivered in tempore non suspecto, and so we will comply with that. In that case, the question arises whether the Algerian kafala, that is, a type um, here in Kafala, whether it can be equated or not with a, say now, somewhat simplified, a Western law type adoption or not. And that is relevant in turn to know whether an Algerian child, a baby girl in this case, which is taken up in the family of a French couple living in the United Kingdom, whether that child becomes part member of the family of the, this couple and has a right of residence under the Directive 2004-38, Legislative Act of the Union. Now I say that because you see how the cases come to us. It's not for us a human rights case. It's the case, does this Algerian child taken up in the family of a French couple which for professional reasons works as union citizens in the United Kingdom, does that child on the basis of union law have the right to join them there and have a right of residence based on European Union law? So for us it was the very first time that we were confronted to such a question. What did we do? We searched the whole case law of the Strasbourg Court. And there we found cases where the Algerian kafala, but also the kafala of other um, Islamic countries, had been analyzed in the light of the fundamental right to protection of family life. So, in order to protect it, they had to make themselves an opinion, does that child become a family member or not? And that's not a very easy question because, and I stand to be corrected, but as it was explained, and absolutely consensual in the case, under Islamic law itself, under Sharia law, the, the child does not become the descendant of the, I say now, between many quotation marks, parents taking the child up in the family. So it's almost an express denial of a descendancy relationship. And then the question, is it nevertheless protected as family life? And this trigger protection of family life or not, if there is family life or not, makes a difference whether that child should be seen as a member of the family within the meaning of that directive. So again, here, the construction or the, or the question answered by the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom is about the correct um, interpretation, uniform everywhere, beautiful illustration of what I already explained, of a child in that situation as protected under the directive as a member of the family getting the right of residence or not, but in order to make ourselves an opinion, we in fact go and see what Strasbourg does. We take it over, insert it in our reasoning for 
purposes and in a context which Strasbourg has never thought of, because for them it's only a matter to know whether those children and the quote-unquote parents receiving these children, whether they are protected or not under Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. We use their work and insert it in a totally different context of European Union law. And that happens all the time. The relations between the two courts are excellent. We have two working sessions every year. So a few weeks ago, they were all sitting here in this very same room. It's, um, and then we, I mean, not all of them because they are 47, eh? but I mean uh, 15 people of them and then also a whole delegation of our court here and we work on the case law of the past year of them which can be relevant for us and what we are doing which can be relevant for them. Eh? So it's a very, very good, um, uh, good cooperation. But it's two totally different institutions which have in fact technically speaking, nothing in common, but which are very important nevertheless for them. We are also important for them. They are important for us. My example shows it, but also the opposite. Thank you. As, as you, you heard, so he discussed the kafala and uh, the uh, perhaps the interpretation of kafala into a uh, a european jurisdiction so i'm not going to comment for the interest of time on that uh, and perhaps if there are questions i would love to discuss them in the q a session uh, so these are some of the other terms that are used uh, in this context of cross uh, border cooperation uh, in criminal matters uh, and i really feel uh, very um when when i see the translations in the documents uh, I, I feel that there is always something lost uh, uh, forfeiture for example and confiscation both are translated musadara uh, in arabic but there is a, a slight difference uh, always so there is this loss uh, let's move on. Uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to go to the takeaway uh, message. All in all, interpreting looks two ways. It opens up a passage and a heart, drawing near what might always remain afar. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time, for your attention, and over to you, uh, Simon and Sami. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hamouda. This is a very insightful and interesting uh, topic that you uh, just kicked off uh, with us today. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I'm asked to moderate the first set of questions. Um, in order to give the time to uh, the participants to put their questions on the chat uh, function, um, and by the way, they can put their questions in either language, Arabic, French, or, or English, I will be able to moderate them in, Ang in, in English to you uh, afterwards. Um, we were supposed to allocate um, 30 to 40 minutes for this Q&A session. Are we still okay with that, uh, Hamouda and uh, Simon? Yeah, very well, fair enough. Uh, so I will uh, maybe take the advantage of being the co-moderator of this uh, session in order to ask you a couple of questions, and this will allow the time to uh, the participants to put their question in the chat function. Um, you've uh, tackled really um, very diverse um, series of topics during this particular presentation, which is uh, pertaining to the, the very job of a translator and uh, an interpreter. Um, but at the end of the day, when you come back to our core uh, of business, which is translating, conveying the message, either translating on a sheet of paper or interpreting over the microphone, don't you think that legal uh, translation or interpretation isn't just another type of specialized 
translation or interpretation. It is not such, uh, it, it might seem very difficult to grasp uh, for, for beginners, but uh, it shouldn't be considered as something out of reach because otherwise we would frighten uh, practitioners to, uh, to, to enter this, uh, this field of uh, quite, let's say, sensitive uh, field of, uh, of translation. So this is the first question. Isn't it just another type of specialized translation and uh, interpretation? Uh, knowing that from all what we heard from you today, what I personally um, took as a, as a final takeaway is that any translator and any interpreter, in order to excel in what he's doing, he has to get profound knowledge of the topic, be it legal, be it medical, be it anything. So this was the first question. The second question, you concentrated, you talk on the relationship between the translator, the interpreter, and the judge. Why didn't you talk about the very difficult relationship between the interpreter, translator, and uh, lawyers, defense, with prosecution, with the experts? of the tribunal, which is, I, I find personally as uh, someone who uh, works a lot in arbitration cases, very difficult relationship that we have with the experts, for example, with, uh, with, with the prosecution, with, uh, with defense, more than with the judges, because the judge at the end of the day is just a listener <laughs> for interpretation uh, cases. Um, and a final question, if I may, and I see that there is already a question in, I think, in the chat. A final question, as we know, there are uh, mainly four big uh, legal traditions in the world. There is uh, the common law, civil law, uh, customary law, religious law. Uh, I didn't hear you talk about those four systems and how they impact, or the knowledge of the translator and the interpreter impacts on his uh, quality. So thank you. I think I give you enough of a <laughs> uh, substance to, uh, to, to kick off this discussion. Very much. And of Thank course, you, Sammy. Do you, I yes, invite everyone to start putting the question in the chat. Or, or they can. Uh, oh, of course, they can, they can. Yeah, they can also ask for the floor if they want to put your, their questions in English. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, Sammy, do you like me to answer now or to take um, I two think or three it, questions we, together? Yeah, maybe. Or let you ask, you ask four or five questions. So, yeah. Uh, Let me start yeah, yeah, uh, uh, so. responding to these two questions first. Uh, Thank you very much. May, Sammy. May, maybe just one technical thing that Easy. whoever wants to take the floor, maybe we, we would just ask, like to ask them to use one of the those um, reactions, one of those icons. Uh, you find them at the bottom of the Zoom window. So if you could please, for example, such as, uh, I can't find it right now, but uh, you could use the hand, just raise your hand so that we know that you want to ask a question. Okay. True. Sure. Okay, thank sorry you, about Simon. that. Yeah. Yes. Just go ahead. Uh, thank you, um, Sammy, for, for these uh, questions. Really, they are uh, very pertinent questions uh, related to the uh, arguments I have laid uh, uh, down. Um, uh, anxiety, you, you, you uh, refer to the term anxiety that I have used. Anxiety, sometimes, if it is very well, of course, I don't recommend educators and teachers, uh, instructors are in training programs, training of interpreters or, translator, uh, tra or translators to use this term or to emphasize on it. Certainly, yes. Otherwise, you will discourage people uh, from joining uh, this profession, which is really uh, a very beautiful profession, to tell you the truth. And it's very rewarding, especially interpreting. Now, but it needs hard work. Uh, now, anxiety is um, when you feel that there is always something lost, this will um, incite you to, to do uh, research. So, And you should not be confident about the equivalences you find in a parallel corpus or a dictionary or your lexical, a mental lexicon that you know or you rely on your previous experience so there is always something so you look for the better to uh, improve the quality of your work so anxiety has to be used in the positive sense not in the negative sense so isn't so it this just is another type of specialized translation the second question is 
Exactly. Uh, well, I think it is another type of specialized translation or interpreting, but there is a, a major difference here, Sami, and you know this quite well, that translating, uh, the law has a power, you see, not like translating creative texts. Creative texts, you have some space of freedom and intervention is being justified sometimes. Uh, if uh, And the... Uh, uh, the translator or the interpreter will feel more comfortable to uh, use his idiosyncratic preferences, but not in a legal jargon, in a legal context. He is bound uh, to certain uh, uh, terms that he has to use them, not other terms. So it is not an ordinary, it is a specialized uh, translation, but it is not an ordinary because of the power. Law is power, especially in court interpreting. Now, the other thing is about knowledge. Uh, uh, I think he is well uh, equipped, the translator. He can perform better. But the problem here, and you know this quite well, Sami, is that access to knowledge is sometimes problematic and challenging. You can access knowledge about some general topic or even a cutting edge subject that is available on the internet or open sources, but these questions are not open to the public most of the time because they are very sensitive. You know that. That's why I call for a better... I disagree with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I would call for a better cooperation with, uh, with, with judges. With judges and try to revisit even the uh, idea of status of the interpreter and translator uh, with the participants in a conference, including judges, of course. Why judges and not lawyers? In uh, international judicial cooperation, we here speak more about judges who are the stakeholders, not lawyers. So uh, especially in mutu mutual legal assistance, the, uh, this is a very first phase before prosecution, before the trial takes place, there needs to be some cooperation for, for example, obtaining evidence and so on. And a lawyer uh, is not involved in this case when there is suspicion of a crime or a suspect person. So it is the work of prosecutors and judges. And prosecutors are judges, uh, mm, by yes. the way. And, or law enforcement agencies. Law enforcement yes, agencies, uh, but not lawyers. Lawyers, they, there, is, there are perhaps frameworks for cooperation. But here, because I am bound to a case study, which is... Uh, Euro-Mediterranean space and uh, international judicial cooperation uh, where the participants, all of them that I have interviewed, were judges. I see. So that's why yes. you, uh, you concentrated on, on judges. Exactly. Because so. when, when, you, uh, when you see the length of a trial, for example, uh, the pre-trial proceedings, uh, they seem uh, very long because mm -hmm. you never know when the trial will start. But at sure. the end of the day, uh, I, I talk here as an interpreter. At the end of the day, as an interpreter, I'm not talking about the translator. As an interpreter, you will deal much more with uh, the prosecution and with the defense than with, with, with the judges. But I agree with you for, for the uh, MLA uh, context. Quits, yeah. yeah. This is uh, this is exactly what, it, especially with the investigative judge. Yeah. Exactly. Or when you are dealing with the transfer of convicted or sentenced persons. So this is the role of uh, like that. extradition. So it is the work of judges and not uh, the, the lawyer's task is over. Uh, now, the four traditions, yes, I agree with you, of, of course. Uh, when you move from one tradition to another, then you will be uh, exactly like different cultures and different terms, different jargons, and uh, even the same term means different things. Notions. Uh, so, I, yeah, uh, notions. Uh, so, I, I totally agree with you. Thank you very much. Yeah, we already received uh, one question on the chat. Thank you very much, Marwa Mafi. And the question is, is interpreting as uh, idiosyncratic, uh, is interpreting as uh, idiosyncratic as writing? Yes, I uh, certainly believe that uh, when you interpret, you have some preferences as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, idiosyncratic uh, use of uh, language 
uh, is very common, uh, even by politicians, uh, when they speak, when they deliver their speeches, like uh, the former uh, president uh, of Tunisia, Bourguiba, he used to use the expression تحصل معناها. تحصل معناها. He, wa- he was known for that. And the interpreters, when I hear interpreters, I know uh, uh, some expressions that are very common and they know, I see you smiling, Sami, because uh, you, I know that you recall some of your colleagues who are uh, using particular expressions. And this is part of our preferences uh, because we don't use uh, language, but what we know from that language or what we like in that language and we tend to cast light upon it and use it and there are preferences and i'm one of them i know that yes. my preferences yeah right okay thank you for the uh, the answer we've got another question from uh, slim ganzui the question is in which case if any translator is context free or context independent or is he or she always bound to context Uh, I think the only context uh, I know where a translator can really distance himself a little bit or to some extent from the context is poetry, translating poetry despite the fact that it is this is controversial or sometimes creative pieces of writing. But uh, you cannot because pragmatics, which is a new branch of knowledge which is uh, gaining currency uh, teaches us that you cannot speak out of a vacuum you have to speak within a context you have to think of a context so otherwise will be parrots or dictionaries stating words out of context so yeah and the context is really uh, very complex Uh, the context may mean also the field of knowledge, like the law, there is subfield that is, uh, uh, let's say, the field of criminal, uh, uh, criminal context, criminal policy, uh, courts, and, uh, and then it's not court interpreting that I have spoken about today, but rather uh, judicial cooperation between states and uh, uh, central authorities, basically uh, MOJs, Ministries of, of, Just. of Justice. So this is another context that is a subfield. Exactly, exactly. And I, I, I tend to concur with you. Just yesterday, I, I finished the revision of a, a PhD in, in mathematics in French. And I have no knowledge whatsoever in, in, in mathematics in that uh, level. I just w- was able to, to revise the French But all the rest was in French, but I couldn't understand a single concept. It was extremely difficult. So context is something that the translator has to live with. I will ask you uh, a final question before I render the floor to to Simon to uh, complete this um, question and answer session. And it is question by Mohammed Rahmouni. He says, United Nations Security Council resolutions. Uh, are based on international law and are written in different languages. So how do we overcome the problem of contradictory interpretations uh, that might be due to a bad translation? Whether, because uh, I understand the question, but usually uh, I I will give you just part of the answer. Uh, It cannot be authoritative Um, until it's revised by jurist linguists. But anyway, I'll leave you the floor. And I, I hand it over to you, Simon, for, 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 for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, again, um, uh, English is used as a lingua franca, as I, as I mentioned in the lecture. And uh, the, the primary language uh, that is being used to draft uh, documents and uh, to interpret Uh, uh, speeches. Uh, now, English, when you translate uh, that document into other languages, then there is always some loss. And again, as Semi has uh, rightly said, uh, the process of drafting and translating is collaborative to a large extent. And it is not 
exclusively the work of translators and interpreters, but rather jurists, uh, um, legal practitioners in this case, for example, resolutions, and even uh, sociologists. And if the resolution has to do with refugees, for example, uh, it has to do, uh, so uh, it has to be read also and reviewed by other experts. So this exactly. is a yeah. collaborative, uh, collaborative uh, uh, dimension or approach to drafting. But again, um, each language will be interpreted differently. So when and uh, I think uh, the 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 worst uh, conferences an interpreter can service would be to me when they discuss a draft with different versions. I think uh, this gives the interpreter a hard time just to translate and then you, which is still in the process of drafting, and then you translate back into the original uh, language and there is always some me meaning loss uh, and then you will see the uh, the discussion will never end so uh i think uh, this is one of the challenges uh, yeah if i if i might complete please go ahead yeah listen. thank you if uh, just one last thing uh, um in the european court of justice in luxembourg uh they have created a new uh they have they had created some 35 years ago a new kind of a job which is the job of a, a jurist linguist so these are translators and lawyers so in order for you to apply for that job you must have a degree in law and also a degree in translation or demonstrate ability to translate and master of course at least two or three different languages of the european union so this is uh, again going back to the knowledge that is necessary in order to avoid uh, spending lots of resources in revising documents made just by generalist uh, translators. So there is this title, which is jurist linguist. So if you're just a translator, just an interpreter, you cannot apply. And there are, there are I think they have something like 20 per language, and there are uh, 24 languages in the European Union. Over to you, Simon. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we've, in the meantime, we've had another uh, comment um, from Zeynep Demi. So maybe I can just read it. Um, so I thought before that the judge's discretion shouldn't be subject to idiosyncrasy till I watched one day a televised program on real court hearings by a famous American judge called Frank Caprio. I was touched by his peculiar humane uh, power. So, uh, and then later it was added that the judge is, after all, is a human being. And then uh, we had another question um, from Muhammad uh, Badreddin. So, how do we get the knowledge to identify equivalences or similarities between laws in different countries and as legal interpreters? And does that difference really exist? Yeah, thank you for the question, Muhammad. Uh, certainly uh, there are differences and where to identify the differences is uh, by practice and um, uh, attending meetings and uh, accessing uh, some sources of uh, knowledge like judges themselves. So when they, uh, by the way, most of the comments I have taken note of, uh, they derive from informal conversations I have conducted with judges uh, over coffee in the coffee break, for example, when they discuss certain things like, for example, I came to learn that, for example, uh, a child abduction in English translated in the documents and interpreters, they used the term of اختطاف الأطفال من قبل ذويهم الأبوين مثلا child abduction by a parent then in Jordan for example I remember that I had a very fruitful discussion with a Jordanian judge uh, in civil matters of course uh, uh, he told me 
we are reluctant to use the term اختطاف because اختطاف and abduction falls within another matter which is the criminal matter, criminal law, not the civil law or the family law. So here, if you translate it straight without knowing the, the fact that it is not punishable, that act under criminal law in Jordan, for example, uh, then there is a failure. Uh, so uh, this is one source, is the judges themselves and attending meetings like that and reading uh, documents and jurisdictions. Now, we agreed to use another term in Arabic, which is in French, we have the same problem. Pr problem, exactly. Le, le rapt parental et l'enlèvement. Le rapt parental par les parents et l'enlèvement par, par une tierce personne. Tout à fait. Merci, Sami. Donc, uh, so, um, this is to say that Uh, you need to get into discussion. If you really would like to excel in legal translation and in, in, uh, in interpreting judicial, uh, judicial, in the judicial context, then uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have the passion for learning and uh, accessing uh, such knowledge and knowledge will find its way to you, certainly. Can I just complete what you said yes, uh, in your in your answer? I, I liked very much the example you laid down about uh, you know the difference between um, you know the two notions of abduction, whether from a parent. In French, as I said, uh, it's le rapt. It's the same word in English, abduction, mm -hmm. but in French it would be translated as le rapt if it's by one of the parents, and it will be translated by enlèvement. So it means that the translator has to ask maybe. Uh, the law enforcement officer or the prosecutor, was it a parent that uh, abducted the child or was it somebody else? If he says it's the parent, so you will have to use rapt. Uh, the same for the word in, in Arabic, for example, the translation of uh, the word uh, victim. Everyone uh, is um, prone to say the hayya. While it's not the hayya, it's the hayya if it's dead. It's majni alay if it's not dead. So do you, this is very important. So you have to know that as a translator or as an interpreter. So when you translate, you hear victim. So directly a, bank, a, ring, a bell should ring. <laughs> is it dead or is it still alive? If it's dead, it's the hayya. If it's not dead, it's majna alay. Otherwise, the specialized people that listen to you will say, oof. The translator is not really knowledgeable of what he's saying. The same mm. thing with um, the, the different categories of crimes. There is a difference between a misdemeanor, felony, you know, misdemeanor. felony misdemeanor, and crime. crime. The first thing, uh, uh, or for example, in French, la différence entre the difference between une instruction uh, judiciaire, une information judiciaire. Every translator, every interpreter should know that une instruction judiciaire is moved by a magistrate, uh, an, an investigative judge. While, uh, yeah, while l'information judiciaire, it's exactly the same thing. It's a prosecution thing. So it's looking for, uh, depending on, on your legal system, uh, if it's French or, 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 or uh, common law or civil law, adversarial or not adversarial, uh, you will look for uh, the proof for and against. So uh, in French, if it's Um, uh, an inquiry in English, you have to know whether it comes from the investigative judge, and then you will use instruction judiciaire. But if it, it's the same word in English, <laughs> inquiry. But if it comes from the prosecution office, you can't use instruction judiciaire. You have to use information judiciaire. So this is the kind of knowledge that the translator should be very curious about. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally agree with you, Sammy. Thank you for these uh, very concrete examples. And I would like to add one, one other example in, in the same vein. Uh, here the question, for example, to show how context uh, is really very important, even in technical terms and legal terms that may seem uh, context independent, but they are highly context dependent. Like the term, for example, I had to serve a conference in, in, in The Hague uh, two, weeks ago, two years ago about access to justice. Uh, and the word, uh, the term access to justice 
is really problematic when you translate it into Arabic. Uh, most of the documents, they uh, translate it as Al-Ihtikam ila Al-Qadha. Or Nafad ila Al-Adala. Or Nafad ila Al-Adala. Nafad is something uh, uh, very problematic. Uh, a word, this is preference again. I don't like the word Nafad. Uh, yeah. This is idi idiosyncratic uh, preference. Not to use Nafad means access to penetrate. Yeah, uh, in, this is the sense of penetrating into the, the thing, which has side effects and connotations. Mm. But nafed uh, is like using power. When you access nafed with penetrate, use power and force, which is not, it's a side effect that is not meant. Well, in the access original. is just to get an easy access to. Uh, exactly, exactly. Access to justice, it's not only uh, lodging uh, or uh, uh, or uh, bringing a case before the court. It has to do also with getting information from a lawyer uh, or the legal aid uh, and legal aid. So access to justice is not only when you have a case that is being considered by a judge. No, there is. Uh, for example, if you seek uh, some certified document, then this is access to justice. Access no, to justice. One of its means... Right. Exactly. The other thing that I would like to mention here is that uh, and how uh, terms are also dependent on culture and ideology. Uh, the term, for example, inmate, in, and you mentioned this term uh, early on, Sami, inmate or prisoner. So even in, Eng in English, when you say inmate, something and prisoner referring to the same person, he is being called inmate by... Uh, for example, the prison management, and even prison is not called prison. So, depending uh, on the uh, the the the, 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 the stage, who is the, the stage speaker, of trial the, and the stage the, of of trial. And not only that, Sammy, but also uh, the 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 speaker. Exactly. Uh, and I can give you example from the Tunisian context. For example, um, the uh, prison management they really protest against the term "messagin." Uh, the direct equivalent of or the clo closest equivalent of prisoner. They, Iraq, they, they say Nuzala. Exactly. And the other term is Nuzala. You see, I've written it here. Nuzala. Hey, you see, you see, we have you the see, same yes. brain connections. Of course. Interpreters are always like that. And in, in Tunisia, they use another term, which is al Mudaun. Just they are deposited. So literally speaking. Uh, ça vient but, du, du système de droit français, ça. Droit français, ah ouais, tout à fait. But still, but still, they insist on that term. And I remember that there was uh, one staff member in a uh, correctional facility. And they use the term correctional facility, by the way, not prison. Correctional facility uh, who protested against the use of uh, Nuzala. Even Nuzala, which is a, the soft softer version of messagine or sujana but this, despite the, the the softness of it he protested against it as i find the iraqis very precise on this uh, they they use three terms for that they use uh, uh, so for the, for those who are not uh, convicted yet then the al mahkumun the convicts, so those who are in prison prisoners and inmates it's when they speak with each other when they are inside prison, so they're inmates. Uh, and to be a bit more neutral, so they say nuzala. So they have a tarhilat, mahkumun, one nuzala for the same word, which is interesting. So it requires prior knowledge by the translator or by the interpreter, as always. Sure. Okay, and by I the way, nuzala for us, oh. for us is for hotels. So In Morocco hotels. too, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think thank you guys. I think we have another uh, question in the um, in the chat. So the question came from Alexandra Matuleuska and she asked the following so to what extent should we relativize or adjust our interpretation to the communication needs of the message recipient especially when the recipient has a limited command of law and language? A very good question indeed. Yeah. So uh, that's true, especially when English is being used by a non-native speaker. 
there is uh, a problem here. And I think that interpreters need to take that into account. I know one interpreter who is really fond of um, archaic expressions in, in English and proverbs and sayings, but uh, most of the time uh, his English is not being understood quite well by non-native speakers of, of, of English. So he's, he's a very good interpreter. Uh, but uh, uh, we have a saying in, in Arabic, لِكُلِّ مَقَامٍ مَقَالٍ so you need to speak to the people in the language they understand in the, that context. And the language they understand is not the very sophisticated language. This is the first piece of answer to this question. The other thing, that's why, and the other uh, uh, point I would like to make is that the interpreter needs to know his audience and needs to have um, some idea about the level of fluency, fluency in the language the working language at least, the, or the working languages, uh, to tailor the message to their needs, to their needs, but being uh, also correct about what he is saying. Of course, this is part of discourse. This is part of discourse, and uh, the addressee is part of the discourse you are going to produce because the interpreter is going to produce a second discourse you cannot reproduce uh, uh, everything in the original discourse. You have to tailor it to your audience, target language audience. Uh, and uh, the other thing, uh, can you remind me, uh, Simon, the second part of the question? So the question was, um, so how, to what extent should, the, uh, should we relativize or adjust our interpretation to the communication needs of the message recipient when the recipient has a limited command of law and language? Okay, when the recipient uh, does not uh, is not an expert in the matter, I think that uh, you can convert. It is possible if it is not very functional. Uh, that term, for example, uh, so you have you have freedom. You have uh, more freedom to express the uh, terms in a more general way. It means general voc using general vocabulary instead of uh, a, a specialized term and a, 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 or a, an excessively technical term or sophisticated. So yeah, I, I think because he is if he, the recipient is not an expert, is not a, a legal practitioner, then there is no need to get into that complicated. Uh, discussion or uh, worry so much about the, uh, uh, the the equivalent in in the in the other language. So this is my piece of answer. And Sammy, I don't know whether you'd like to add something. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to add that exactly what you said in the beginning. Um, our job as, uh, as interpreters, uh, talking about myself, not because I'm not doing much of. Um, yeah, um, translation, uh, you know, in the legal field, in spite of the fact that I translated from Arabic into French, the Lebanese uh, code of, uh, of, uh, of penal proceedings. Um, uh, when you want to convey a message and you know that the person you're conveying it to is a lay layman, no, is not a specialized person, you wouldn't serve the purpose of your mission if you used a uh, specialized language, specialized jargon. You know that the person will not understand. So your mission is to make him understand, to make her understand. So you must uh, adapt yourself to the level of linguistic knowledge of your audience. I agree with you. Okay. Um, just before we go on, maybe one question both for you, Hamuda, and for you, Sami. It's now already quarter two, um, and but we still have a, a large crowd. I think as large as it was half an hour ago, and we have a couple, a few more questions. So my question first is: uh, Is it okay with you if we continue maybe for another ten or fifteen minutes? Okay. Good. So we actually have a question from the floor from Mr. Mohammed Jabbar. So please, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Mine is not actually a question. I simply wanted to make a comment in uh, relation to interpreting and context. 
I heard earlier that context uh, was of paramount importance, and I totally concur with that viewpoint. Um, however, we should not reduce uh, meaning to context. Of course, as interpreters, we deal a lot with context, but we also deal with meaning at different levels of linguistic analysis, because meaning can lie with a particular word, or it can simply lie in a particular sentence, and that's the case of sentence meaning, or it can also be related to context. The problem with linguistic theory is that we don't know, most of the time we don't know, where meaning may come from. And this makes our life very difficult as interpreters or translators. And we have to handle different levels at the same time. So it would perhaps be slightly reductionist to assume that by controlled context, you'll be able to understand the message. You will, be under, you will be able to understand part of it or most of it, depending on the context sometimes, <laughs> but, you, but it's still, it's still um, uh, mission impossible. Uh, and it comes from the fact that in language theory and linguistics, we don't have a proper theory of semantics. So that's, that's the issue. Um, I also... Uh, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we would really appreciate if you could maybe keep the commentary as short as possible. because we have unfinished. Other... Okay. Unfinished. Thank you. Okay. I, I do apologize, but we have more questions. I'm, I'm I think. So, Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I do. Th thanks a lot. Okay, yeah. So we have uh, another question in the chat uh, from uh, Mohammed. I'm afraid I can't see the whole name. Aha, Badreddin El Fekich. So uh, the question is as follows I would like to know what happens when the judge realizes that the interpretation is wrong or misleading. So is the interpreter penalized? If so, what sanctions does he face? That's probably a question for both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Jeber, for, uh, for your visit. Uh, certainly, yes, I, I, I uh, concur with you that uh, it might uh, seem reductionist approach to uh, read more and then you feel confident. Uh, in my lecture, I stressed the uh, idea of anxiety, that there is always something missing. There is always something that we need to look for. So, and because after all, especially the act of interpreting, even more than the act of translating, the act of interpreting is the art of the possible. There is always something hidden, concealed, uh, bet even between the lines. Sometimes you have access to them, and um, most uh, oftentimes you don't have access to that. So that's why. Uh, the interpreter needs to uh, use his experience of managing the meaning battle. It's a meaning battle. And here you have to get into what I call the meaning ma milking inferences to produce some meaning, sometimes uh, for utterances that are meaningless most of the time, especially if they are produced by non-native speakers of that language, uh, into meaning making. So it is approach of meaning milking to meaning making, but still within the approach of the art of the possible. But thank you again for your comment, Professor Jeber. And I might so, complete something, if, you, if, you, if I may. Uh, as interpreters, we're not only faced by the, the, the pro the pro with the problem of uh, the lack of uh, semantic theory uh, and uh, of the question of uh, are we able to really understand what's being said, we're also faced with the second uh, side of the problem, which is are we able to convey what's being said? So it's a problem of understanding and a problem of conveyance of the message. I don't know if you agree with me, Professor Jaber. I don't know whether he's still with us. I, I, I agree, sir. I agree, yes. Thank you, Anya. And now maybe to the uh, second question. So about the sanctions for the interpreter. Uh, if it turns out their interpretation, for example, was incorrect or misleading. 
Do you have a, a say ha- on that? Hamoud, are still with us? Or maybe I should, uh, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. Shall, I shall answer the question. Hamoud, are you with us? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Still. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I thought that the, the, the judge uh, said something misleading. Not, or he, uh, she, or she meant the interpreter or the, uh, the, the judge? I think the interpreter. For the inter- uh, the misleading, yeah, 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 misleading. Or, I think this question is of an ethical order. I think there are no sanctions, but uh, I think this is regulated by the codes of conduct, and the IEC has uh, produced uh, guidelines on that. Um, saying something misleading uh, or false. Uh, I think in some conferences, it is the responsibility of the chief interpreter to watch out the performance and see whether there are some uh, claims uh, submitted by the uh, audience and regulate that or deal with that. But uh, the sanctions, I think the worst sanction for an interpreter is not to be called again. And this happened. There is worse than that. Tell me. I, I will tell you. <laughs> but continue, please. I'll tell you later. Yes. So uh, if you lose the job or you use the client, and there are so many uh, cases in which the uh, interpreter caused a problem, uh, a diplomatic incident uh, in some instances uh, between the participants. But again, this this should not prelude the fact that the interpreter is almost always the weakest link. And when there is a conflict, they always tend to to put the blame on the interpreter. Oh, I didn't mean that. Oh, it's perhaps a mistake in uh, in interpreting. Uh, So, uh, but uh, I think if you really could not understand it quite well, I think no no problem just to... uh, uh, explain to the participants in the conference that uh, I really thought that, or if in the, when on mic, when the interpreter is on mic, uh, he or she can correct it immediately. And this happens, and there is no problem with that. Yes, Sammy, over to you. Yeah, I, I wanted again to complete what you say. Uh, th- there is some uh, synchro- synchronicity between between both of us in in this. Uh, in this reflection, uh, what happens when an interpreter uh, makes mistakes? Of course, if it's just in the context of a normal conference, uh, it's okay. You can correct yourself. You can just pass the microphone to the colleague. But in, in the context of uh, a trial, there is worse than not being called again. And the worse is that you're being excluded a- immediately from, from the booth, which happened many times. And the last of which for me was just three days ago. Uh, Yeah, not me, thank God. Uh, You know, it was a very, very difficult arbitration case between uh, a state, an Arab state, and a very, very big French company. Uh, The uh, litigation uh, or the the conflict resolution center was uh, a uh, center based in an Arab country, and they insisted on bringing their own interpreters, who unfortunately were not fit for that very difficult job. But the French client decided, just in case, to hire as a backup a team of interpreters of his own. When I saw the names of uh, the interpreters, one of them stood out and I, I, I know the person and I immediately told the client, you have to tell your counterpart, even if it's very difficult because it's very sensitive, you know, to, to, to make your, your, let's say, enemy accept another group of interpreters, you have to tell them that we might face huge problems five minutes after the beginning of the examination or the beginning of the cross-examination or direct or redirect. These are the terms when, when, you, uh, when you, uh, you, uh, you, 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 inter- you interrogate witness, uh, witnesses. And what happened was exactly what I forecasted. Uh, they started with their own interpreters and three minutes after it started, everything had to stop because nobody could understand anything. It started by, okay, could you please repeat? 
and the witness is asking question to the interpreter. So this is a real flaw. It's like zero uh, at an exam, because if you have someone talking to an interpreter, it means that the interpreter didn't do the job. And after three minutes, judge, uh, the, 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 the president of the panel uh, had to interrupt the whole trial and ask whether there was another team of interpreters ready to take over. Unfortunately, the client had foreseen that. Uh, and it also happened many other times where there was no backup team of interpreters, where the whole trial or the whole arbitration has to stop. And arbitrations, they cost a hell of money hell of money. So this is, I think, uh, much more delicate, much more sensitive than only not being hired again. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. Um, Thank you. Yeah, we have a couple of a uh, few more comments in the chat. You can maybe have a look at them. And then because uh, it's getting close to eight, maybe if I allow myself to ask a one question. And uh, the question is as follows. Um, how do you see the status of the in, uh, how do you see the status of the interpreter compared to, for example, judges or lawyers? And I'm asking this um, uh, having in mind um, uh, Loris Venuti, who back in the 1990s, a famous translation scholar, who back in the 1990s um, spoke of the translators and interpreters' invisibility. Okay, and. Uh, how would you compare the status of, as I said, for example, uh, or the statuses of uh, the interpreter, the judges, and lawyers, in particular, if you compare different legal settings, different countries, for example? Thank you, Simon, for this uh, really good question. Indeed, uh, the question of status, status of the interpreter, uh, in an interpreted event where he is located and more than that how is the interpreter being perceived by the other participants and whether he is visible or not and whether the other participants would like him to be visible or not especially in a political context uh, the interpreter is always a reminder of the um, high-profile leaders that they have something different uh, and the presence of the uh, of the um, of the interpreter is really not recommended even in the picture they would like to shake hands without the uh, presence of the uh, interpreter uh, the yes and here they would like to exclude the visibility but again communication Communication is most of the time a two-party communication. But in the case of interpreting, it is a three-party communication. And you cannot ignore the existence of the mediator, the interpreter, who is mediating between uh, uh, the addressee and the addresser and vice versa. And this brings us to the question of power, brings us to the question of freedom. So whether you can make yourself more visible using some power and the power you have to derive it from your knowledge, uh, knowledge of the, uh, and the, it's a mediation power and, and the freedom to go the extra mile. Uh, I think junior interpreters are not capable of, between inverted commas, imposing that. But competent interpreters, they can uh, negotiate some better terms and have a uh, better status, a better status. And the status is not to be, at least not to be denigrated or to be perceived as the weakest link. And that you are just a second class participant or communicator. Uh, I think this is a wrong methodology, and I am really not very well pleased by the uh, way the interpreter is being presented in codes of conduct and codes of ethics. You have to be serving 
this is, this is the language. Uh, and uh, uh, you have to stick to that, uh, despite the fact that there are some other ethical issues, not to talk with the participants, with the delegates, for example, and you have a chief interpreter and so on. So this is, in a way, reducing the freedom. Because you, I think, if you are uh, a good interpreter, I would say, and the others will understand your job, uh, of course, you should not use this access to the participants and to delegates for other ends, let's say commercial ends. And I know so many people who are just uh, uh, at the outset, they start uh, distributing their business cards. This is not ethical, certainly. But to use it to and to listen at least to the to to, to the speaker, to get familiar with his accent, uh, to uh, have a discussion with him. And in my uh, experience, uh, in in my um, experiences in interpreting, I always tend to interview the participants and speakers, exactly like the uh, interview that you have heard early on by the president of uh, the European Court of uh, Justice. Uh, and I have now compiled the whole corpse of recordings of participants from different backgrounds. And some of them are posted on the YouTube channel of Turjuman. So I am, I'm with that opinion of having access and discussing without, and you will be presenting yourself more as a researcher because the interpreter is a researcher after all. Accessing knowledge is not easy. You need to be a researcher. So, and this is a better status for some, at least. So, this if is I may, answer. I'd like to add something. Uh, uh, the visibility or invisibility of a translator and interpreter depends on the setting. For the translations, we say that the the translator becomes invisible when the the the, the reader in the target language feels that he's reading a text that was uh, written in the original language. So he doesn't feel the translation layer. So there, the translator becomes invisible, and that's me that means he got the best mark possible. So we want translators and interpreters to be invisible because we want them to be the best. If you want to be visible as a translator uh, or an interpreter, it means you don't want to be the best. So if you want to be the best, seek invisibility. Okay? Thank you. Great, great. Thank, thank you. May I add just one point, 30 seconds, Simon? Sure, uh, sure. Is that sometimes uh, invisibility is recommended? Sometimes. In courtroom, for example, the interpreter has to be invisible behind the curtain. If he is visible or she is visible, then he will be a uh, soft target for the perpetrator or the victim. Lynched so this at is the end of a conference. Absolutely. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, some contexts are really sensitive, political contexts. And I remember I served meeting for uh, the opposition in Sudan uh, a couple of years ago. They were preparing the uh, toppling of uh, President Omar al-Bashir. And uh, when the um, media outlets uh, uh, get in to cover the event or the closing statements. Uh, they insist, the participants insisted that the interpreters be part of the team and the interpreters refused. They don't like to be seen because they might be having a ban on traveling to Sudan at that time. So when uh, the Sudan was under uh, the uh, rule of Omar al-Bashir. So I these are two uh, sorry, I was not talking about invisibility as being seen or not seen. I was talking about invisibility as uh, not felt being part of the context or the configuration. We don't want to, to be felt that we ever existed in the configuration. So if someone reads a text and doesn't realize that it was a translator, it is a translated text, that's the best mark for the translator. And at the end of the conference, I always tell my students, if you want to know whether your work has been appreciated, uh, you just have to assess the final minutes of a conference. If, if nobody looks back and sees who's there, or nobody says anything about you, it means it was good. But if everybody starts looking at you, it means there is, there is an issue. And there is, of course, a difference between 
consecutive and simultaneous. This is valid for simultaneous interpreting. Consecutive, of course, when you're good, usually they come and salute you or shake your hand when you're good. And there you have to be visible because if you want to be good in consecutive interpreting, especially in bilaterals with heads of states and governments, you have to have the presence, as you said, you have to impose yourself. And then, believe me, even presence of states, so heads of states, will come and shake your hand and say, thank you, it was great. If they don't come, it means it wasn't great. <laughs> but that's for consecutive only. If I can just add a sentence, I fully concur to that. Uh, even though at the same time, I have to say that, uh, that there are instances, I think, where even the, where the interpreter, for example, I think even has the right and even has to sort of make themselves visible. Uh, what comes to mind is an arbitration case in which my colleague and I interpreted in December. And what happened was that, uh, you know, um, at some point, for example, the legal counsel started producing and pulling out some documents that had never been given to us. And they started reading out, you know, really fast. And my colleague and I, what we did was just we stopped interpretation. And then, <clears throat> you, you know, we pointed out to the judge that uh, uh, it was just impossible to produce a good interpretation under the circumstances. And the judge actually intervened. And after that, everything ran smoothly, you know. And this, I think, was uh, one, one good example of where the interpreter, I think, actually does have to make themselves visible. Um, and it would even be, have been unethical, I think, to some extent, had we not intervened, because uh, this would definitely have, uh, have had an adverse impact on the interpretation. Exactly. I couldn't say it better than that. Okay, uh, I also apologize for those interventions because I <laughs> made uh, uh, this uh, lecture a bit longer because of that. But uh, I think the time has now come maybe to wrap it up uh, after uh, two hours. But I have to say that uh, I think we still have a re really large crowd, uh, almost 60 participants, which I think is, is quite impressive after two hours. But I think at the same time, it shows that this was a really intriguing um, subject um, and, um, and definitely a very good um, presentation. So um, I would really like to... Yeah, I'll then but, give, give the floor to you. Uh, oh, maybe you can just... Before that, before you, you wrap up, yeah. I'd just like to, to know from, from Hamouda whether uh -huh. you, you can give us some practical uh, advice as new translators, new interpreters, uh, where to find the best legal interpreting or translation jobs. Where? Nationally and internationally. I should ask you this question, Sammy. You know better. No, but tell me and I can complete. Uh, well, maybe I national, and then I can I can talk about international. For us, national, everything is mono being monopolized by the Ministry of Justice. It is producing and it is uh, organizing the competitive examination for sworn uh, translators and interpreters. Despite the fact that most of them they received no training in neither translation nor uh, uh, interpreting. Uh, just uh, uh, language uh, students uh, or graduates from uh, language schools. Uh, the other thing uh, is that I think it's um, there are three um, masters pro programs in uh, interpreting, and now in Tunisia uh, there are so many international organizations that are uh, working. Uh, from Tunisia, and they are based in Tunisia, um, serving three uh, markets in a way. The local market, Tunisian market, the Libyan market, uh, you know, most uh, uh, international organizations and uh, diplomatic missions, they are serving Libya from Tunis, based from Tunis, uh, and the international market. So, I think that uh, this is the uh, best is uh, to to approach these international organizations based in in in, in your country in in Tunisia in Tunis for example. And over to you Sami. Yeah, that's exactly uh, uh, nationally speaking of course you have to uh 
to 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 reach out to um, to your um, tribunals of first instance, for example, uh, and to see whether you can be sworn as a translator or as an interpreter. It's not the best paid jobs ever. Uh, internationally speaking, of course, uh, the first uh, in Europe. I'm not talking about uh, the United States of America because there, there it's very very uh, difficult uh, since you have to uh, to sit at certain exams to have some grades and things like that before being authorized to work uh, as a as a legal um, interpreter for europe uh, of course you, you, the first thing that you have to think of is to to reach out to the international tribunals in in the hague and we have plenty so we have uh, the uh, icty that's uh, uh, that's over now, and I think uh, the name of the tribunal, uh, it's, they're still working and they're still uh, looking for interpreters and, uh, and translators, but the name, uh, I forgot the, the new name of the RCTY, so it's the International um, Tribunal for, for Former Yugoslavia. You have uh, the uh, STL, Special Tribunal for, for Lebanon. You have, of course, the ICC, the International Criminal Court. Uh, you have plenty of uh, training uh, institutes uh, in The Hague uh, and uh, in Brussels, and I think uh, also in London. Uh, you have also those private um, centers for um, um, dispute settlements, so investment dispute settlements, commercial dispute settlements. Uh, one of them, the most renowned center uh, worldwide is the World Bank uh, ICSID. Uh, and you have, of course, the European Court uh, of Justice, and you have the, um, uh, the Court of Justice of Strasbourg uh, that's uh, under uh, the Council of, uh, uh, of Europe. For, for all those uh, organizations, uh, I think uh, for those who are really interested in, in legal work, uh, these are, uh, and you have also you're just in in the Hague, which is uh, which is very important. I think you worked for them because you speak about uh, judicial uh, cooperation. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you, Sami. I think this was a perfect question to conclude this uh, lecture because we do actually, or I think we uh, actually did have uh, quite a few students, young, I suppose, aspiring interpreters. So this question really uh, nailed it. I think uh, at the end. Um, yeah, and uh, with this, I think that we can really wrap it up. I would really like to thank the speaker, of course, uh, Professor Hamouda Salhi, for the inspiring uh, talk, as well as uh, Sami for helping me chair the, uh, this event. And of course, there are also quite a few people behind who have been working very hard behind the scenes. Unfortunately, I don't know their names, except for maybe Safa and Sonia. So, of course, we also are grateful to them for making this uh, event this online event possible and all i can say is that i'm really looking forward to similar occasions in the future so thank you all thank you very much indeed